Star Wars Battlefront released in November of 2015 to almost universal criticism that while good, there wasn't really enough of it. The lack of weapons, modes, maps and challenges was a huge turnoff for many players and has undoubtedly contributed to the dwindling player numbers on PC. Four months on and the game has seen numerous updates including new content and multiplayer balancing, proving that DICE has committed, at least in the short term, to supporting the game and its fans. So how different is the game to play now compared to launch? Does it hold up as a full price game? And is there a big enough argument to pick this up for anyone still sitting on the fence? The short answer is, sort of. Let's start by discussing what's new. Battlefront now has 19 unique multiplayer maps across four planets. That's a reasonable improvement since launch, and it sounds like a decent number until you factor in that not all modes can be played on every map. Each game mode plays on either a big map or a small one, effectively halving the map count. To get the most out of Battlefront, playing a combination of both the big and small game types is still definitely the way to go. The good news is the new maps added via DLC are really good. They don't feel rushed or slapdash. In fact, I think some of these maps are the best the game has to offer. The Survivors of Endor map, for example, has much more verticality in open areas than the original Endor map, while the undulating sand dunes of Jakku provide a unique kind of warfare not found elsewhere. Weapons unfortunately have seen less love. There are now 13 weapons available for free, and 15 if you buy the first DLC pack. That's two additional weapons over the original selection for anyone counting. There's also a new anti-vehicle weapon available in the power-ups. Weapon choice is still definitely an area that feels lacking, particularly because you can't customise weapons, although DICE has promised more free weapons in the future. The new HUT contract system added in the final March update for acquiring these weapons is also a clever idea. They add some much needed depth to the game, particularly for people already at the level cap. Speaking of which, the level cap has now been increased from 50 to 60, although there's only one new item to unlock at the highest level. And while it's not bad, it's still kind of underwhelming. I think it's safe to assume at this point that DICE will add more incentive long term to keep people coming back, but at this stage it's a pretty meagre offering, and the game is still lacking in character customization options, with nothing new added to the Imperial side since launch. Considering the huge amount of source material to draw from, and the rapid time that skins can be generated using the photogrammetry capture technology, this feels like an area that could and should be padded out. In the final March update, the UI was updated to accommodate the expansion packs. There's also some options to quickly find either big or small game types. I think this is an indication that DICE recognises that to increase the perceived level of content in the game, they need players to start playing more modes. Also in the UI, it's now possible to see all of the planned expansions, and interestingly their scheduled go live windows as well, with the last not being released until early 2017. I'm guessing this is to provide the player base with peace of mind that the game will see support for at least the next year. In regards to the DLC itself, unfortunately the first expansion, The Outer Rim, suffers from many of the same problems as the main game. The new content is great, but a bit slim, and missing the things that many players have been waiting for. You can use the new weapons and star cards in the standard multiplayer though, and it will be interesting to see if DICE can keep these balanced and prevent a pay-to-win scenario from occurring. Along with all this new content, there have already been a few balance updates. So far the changes seem to be predominantly influenced by community feedback, and at this stage I haven't disagreed with any of the buffs or nerfs, and that's even when they were nerfs to my favourite weapons. Back in November, DICE's executive VP, Patrick Soderlund, I've probably butchered that, said that there would be more free content throughout the year, including star cards. We also haven't seen any new single player missions or modes, but there have been a few reports to suggest that this may be in the works. Hopefully all these promises are backed up, and if the stream of free content continues at a steady rate, then we'll have a lot to look forward to in 2016. So as you can see, a lot has happened since launch, and to EA and DICE's credit, most of it has been positive. It doesn't change the fact that the game launched without enough content, a bit of a disturbing trend of late, but their commitment shown via lots of post-launch support does at least show that they know how to turn things around. So does all of this make Battlefront a better proposition? At the beginning I said sort of. On one hand it certainly is a better proposition, but I think for most hardcore shooter fans who haven't opted in at this point, the game is still probably too light on depth. If you didn't like the core game at launch, then it's safe to say you probably still won't care for the more casual approach of Battlefront, as the fundamentals haven't changed. For everybody else who may still be on the fence, then yes, Battlefront is a better product, and it's likely to get better still. 